Welcome to the Scoundrel and Scamp Theater. I'm Brian Falcone, artistic director here. Um, and so I, I say I'm so excited to see so many of your faces after I saw on the agenda what you were doing up till 2 a.m. in the morning last night. I'm impressed you're here with us. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, just want to do just a quick introduction to the space and the historic Y as a whole. Uh, and uh, this Scoundrel and Scamp uh, Theater is actually just about a year old at this point. We just started our second season. And uh, what happened was uh, my wife and I, uh, who uh, moved here from the Midwest, came out here and saw the saguaros and began hiking and then saw the art scene and said, this is where we want to stay. So uh, we had an opportunity to go and open a theater, uh, basically started the process two years ago, and uh, found this wonderful space in here. It was already a dance theater, Zuzi Dance, uh, and it was held together with love and gaff tape. <laughs> so. We came in and we renovated, and we just finished that just about a year ago. And so we replaced the lights, um, the blacks, the seating, everything. It's very, very different if you were here before. Um, but the reason behind wanting to do it was we really wanted to create a place for community to happen. Uh, and uh, as, as <laughs> the net folks might attest, there is a dearth of uh, good performance spaces here in Tucson, and so we wanted to create a space where dance and theater could take place. And so we do our seasons here. We actually have two different seasons we do. We do a season for scoundrels and a season for scamps. Our uh, season for scoundrels is for adults. We just finished Eurydice. Uh, Sarah Rules Eurydice is part of that season. Uh, our season for scamps is for all ages. And so there we really try to focus on physical theater. Um, we did an original work here uh, called Oaf, uh, about a, yes, <laughs> uh, just, just a few months ago. And then uh, Wolf Bowart, who's a local uh, physical theater uh, performing artist, is going to be uh, opening the U.S. premiere of Cloud Soup, his latest work here in December. Um, we also have a show coming up for you Tucson folks. In just about two weeks, we're opening This Girl Laughs, This Girl Cries, This Girl Does Nothing, which is a work by Finnegan Kruckmeyer, who is a uh, wonderful Australian playwright. I'm really excited to view that here in Tucson. So, um, so a few more things. The historic why, uh, we're so excited when we saw the agenda of the presenters that are going to be joining us here because we're like, they're our neighbors, right? So we have the Calib Calibri Center. We've got uh, the Florence Project right next door. The, the historic why built in the 1930s um, is now a place of uh, social justice and education and, and arts organizations. We're one of two theaters in the building. And actually, the space you're in right now uh, is actually an old swimming pool. You are all over the shallow end of the swimming pool. And if you have good eyes, when you go back out to the back parking lot, if you look at where the concrete meets the asphalt, you can see the outdoor pool, uh, what's left of that, the pool deck. So it's really cool to go ahead and reinvest into downtown and reinvent and make new here. Um, so the last thing I wanted to say too was uh, we're just so excited by the presenters that are coming up. I just want to do a quick shout out to Southwest Folklife Alliance and Maribel Alvarez because I'm on their board. <laughs> You won't see me. What if I stand like here? Oh. Well, <laughs> as, um, I can like just as long as you all don't mind me ducking back and forth. Um, thank you so much, Brian, for letting us use this space and for that introduction. It's 
really nice to meet our neighbors a little bit. Um, and thank you so much, Alicia, for having us here today. It's really exciting to me to get to speak. I do presentations. My name is Leah. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Florence Immigrant and Refugee Rights Project. And so my most of my job is giving presentations about our work. Um, and I do a lot of school groups. Oop, and would you um, log into your computer? Uh, I, I work with a lot of school groups, um, faith communities, and it's really exciting to me to get to present to a group of artists because um, I think that a lot of times I focus on academia or education or faith worlds, but um, art is such an important way to connect to social issues and connect social issues to our wider community. So I'm really grateful for all of you for being here today and for being interested in our work. Um, <laughs> well, while Ben figures this out, I'm going to start talking about the Florence Project. Is that okay? Can I still okay. get that task? So um, the Florence Project is a social and legal service provider, and we are the only organization in Arizona that provides services to folks who are in immigrant detention. Um, I think that one of the reasons that the, that we have so many people in detention in this country is because they're really well hidden, um, which is one of the reasons that I'm really appreciative to all of you for wanting to shed light on this subject. So um, on any given day in the state of Arizona, over 5,000 people are incarcerated in immigration detention facilities around the state. Um, and over 1,600 of them are under the age of 18. So this map up on the screen there is a little bit dated, um, and actually 1,000 additional beds were just opened up for in another, a new adult detention facility. But Florence and Eloy are two towns that you all probably actually drove past on your way down from Tempe, um, and they are prison towns, and um, there over 3,000 adults are detained in detention facilities. And then here in Tucson and in the Phoenix metro areas, there are children in shelters for unaccompanied minors, unaccompanied minor immigrants um, who are detained. And um, the immigration justice system, unlike the criminal justice system, does not guarantee the right to representation or to free representation. So. Um, 90 to 95% of immigrants facing detention proceedings will end up going before a judge alone. Um, in 1989, an immigration judge who was seeing a lot of asylum seekers come through his courtroom and lose their cases ended up making a call out to the legal community in Arizona um, to step up and provide representation to these folks because um, if you are in... Uh, asylum proceedings, you're about 10 times more likely to win your case if you have legal representation. The immigration legal system is extremely confusing even to those of us who work in it. So if you imagine going before a judge as a person whose first language probably isn't English um, and who isn't familiar with our justice system at all and particularly our immigration justice system, the cards are really stacked against you. So oftentimes, having representation in court is the deciding factor of whether or not you're able to stay in the United States. And for most of our clients, deportation is a death sentence. So as I mentioned, the Florence Project is the only organization in Arizona that provides free legal and social services to folks who are detained. Um, and we have a number of different programs. We, have, we started in 1989 with an adult program working on a pro se model. So because there are over 5,000 individuals detained in the state of Arizona, and because we are the only organization providing these services, we operated originally on a pro se model, uh, which empowered individuals in the immigration detention system to defend their own cases in court. So we still operate under that model um, for the bulk of our adult work, 
And that's the legal orientation program model, which is now used as the basis for legal orientations around the country for folks in immigrant detention. And so that means that almost every day, some of our legal team is going into detention centers in Eloy, Florence, um, and child detention facilities as well, and offering first a uh, orientation for every single person who passes through the facility on what the immigration system is in the United States, how to defend your case, um, and what your different legal remedies could be. In addition to that, we offer individual consultations with every single person who is interested, um, where our attorney or legal assistant will sit down with them and talk to them about their specific options. And Oftentimes, that entails them talking to us about their entire journey to the United States and what provoked that, um, and then us talking them through what their next steps could be. Um, in addition to that, we connect individuals who end up pursuing asylum cases or other forms of relief to stay in the United States with pro bono attorneys so that um, if a, somebody really wants representation in court, we try and make sure that that can happen for them. Um, additionally, we have a mental health team. So there's a lot of trauma involved in um, the immigration detention system, whether that trauma is the reason that an individual left their home country, whether it happened on the journey, or whether the trauma itself is being in the detention facility. Oftentimes, folks end up with very severe mental health ramifications or came because of severe mental health issues. Um, so we have a national qualified representative program where anybody who is deemed incompetent to represent themselves in immigration court is assigned one of our attorneys to support them and defend them throughout their court process. Uh, we also have a social services team that provides them more holistic support as well. Um, and that oftentimes involves getting them into the nationally qualified representative program if um, a judge is not trauma informed or not mental health informed, um, they oftentimes won't correctly identify whether or not a person is competent to represent themselves in court. And so our legal service and social service providers really advocate for folks um, to get the support that they need while in detention, as well as housing, education, medical services once they are out of detention. And then we also have a children's program. Um, in the shelters, we offer a legal orientation program, which looks very similar to the adult program, except that we try and make it accessible to a younger audience. So oftentimes, um, the children, when we're trying to teach them about the legal system, we're both trying to educate them on what's going to happen to them, but also make it less terrifying and make them feel equipped to um, advocate for themselves in a situation that is um, one of the most scary that they've ever faced. Um, and the way that we do that is by doing um, role plays of what court looks like. Ooh, Ben, you might have to. Oh, no, great. Um, by uh, playing with toys, by um, doing breathing exercises, by using all kinds of practices that make children feel safe and secure. Um, so I always like to um, end my presentation with stories from our clients because our clients are the center of our work. Um, they are both the reason that we exist and the reason that we have the faith to keep on existing. They inspire us every day. Um, so this is Eugenio, and he is one of our NQRP clients. So he was deemed incompetent to re uh, represent himself in court. And I want to share this story that he shared with us. So he grew up in Mexico, close to the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and at the age of 10, his parents separated, and his dad began drinking heavily. Um, and he ended up being abandoned and oftentimes was caring for his siblings. So by the age of 13, he had to drop out of school to begin working. And by the age of 16, he was supporting himself and living on his own. Um, shortly thereafter, he began using drugs and um, started experiencing severe mental health issues. And though he was able to overcome his drug addiction, he um, continued to have hallucinations to the point where he felt that he was constantly under threat. So he came to the United States seeking mental health support and safety. Um, but unfortunately, as soon as he crossed the US-Mexico border, he was taken into custody and detained 
for what ended up being a year and a half without access to mental health care. Um, he met one of our attorneys, Valentina, while he was in detention. And while he was in detention, his uh, symptoms just grew in severity. So he ended up um, hearing voices all of the time and had a really hard time connecting with other people who were in the detention facility uh, because he was so affected by his mental health issues. Um, but with the advocacy of Valentina as his attorney and our mental health team, he ended up getting an evaluation and was um, eventually uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia. Um, so our attorney and mental health team helped him get access to his medication, helped him um, relive his story in order to present it in court with our support. And then eventually he was able to win his asylum case and was released to detention, released from detention to family members in the United States. And he continues to work with our social services team um, and is doing really well um, living outside of detention. So Alberto is one of our kids' clients. Um, and Alberto's story is pretty different from a lot of our kids' clients, at least the end of his story, because while most of the kids that we work with came to the United States because they uh, could not conceive of a future for themselves in their country of origin, um, Alberto, last time we saw him, was talking about his college plans. So um, that's because Alberto is now a permanent resident of the United States. Um, but he did not always have those opportunities. Um, he came to the United States um, because he had been abandoned by his parents. And um, the story that he told us is that he grew up in Guatemala and he was subject to constant physical violence from his father. Um, he was forced to start working at the age of nine years old. And a few years after that, his father abandoned him and his sister in the care of his aunt. Um, and his aunt continued the physical abuse, unfortunately to the point where by the age of 16, Alberto could no longer bear it and decided to leave. Um, but oftentimes the journey to the United States is as traumatic as the reasons that folks leave. While Alberto was um, en route to the United States, he was kidnapped by a Mexican mafia group and held for 20 days in um, a facility just south of the US border. He ended up um, trading all of his possessions for his freedom, but he, shortly after crossing the border, was uh, taken to a child detention facility in the United States. Um, and that's where our team met him. He was a really wonderful and resilient client, but no matter what, for our kids who are seeking asylum or special um, special immigrant juvenile status, which is a special visa for children who are abused or abandoned, the way that they attain those visas is by reliving their trauma in front of a courtroom. So our social workers and legal team supported him through months of reliving the worst <laughs> moments of his life in order to tell them to a judge. Um, and ultimately, he did an amazing job being really brave and sharing his story um, in front of a whole courtroom, and he did win his special immigrant juvenile case and um, now is a permanent resident. And so the last time that we saw him this summer, he had just graduated from high school and he was enrolled in college for the spring and he plans to be an engineer. Yeah. So the Florence Project um, absolutely cannot exist without the support of our community. We are a nonprofit, so our ability to provide legal services and social services to folks in immigrant detention depends completely on the support of people who care and know about the immigration detention system. And when I say support, I do mean financial support, but I think that even more important than that is staying educated and sharing the stories that you hear about folks who are in immigrant detention. I truly believe that the reason that our system exists is because it's so well hidden. Um, so all of you, as people who have a stage and have a platform to talk about social issues, if you want to share our stories, if you're interested in joining us in ensuring that everyone has a fair day in court, please do connect with me. I have business cards. Um, I'm happy to share my information. And I would love to think about ways that we can collaborate to make sure that these stories are heard. Thank you so much.
Um, thank you so much, Leah. Let me swap over here. Um, so good morning, everybody. My name is Ben Clark, and I am the Family Network Coordinator at the Colibri Center for Human Rights. Um, we are a nonprofit in this building, just like the Florence Project and Scoundrel and Scamp, um, that works to end uh, migrant disappearance and uphold human dignity on the U.S.-Mexico border. And today I'd like to talk to you all a little bit about um, the context of death and disappearance on the border, how militarization has shaped this landscape um, and the way that lives are lived and lost, um, and then share with you a few stories as Leah did. Because um, echoing Leah's words, I think one thing that you all as artists can certainly understand is the importance of narrative shift in the work of cultural and social change. Um, I think in this country we're barraged daily with one narrative of what an immigrant is, um, and it's really essential that we understand that these are complete human beings. The people who are lost were more than just disappeared migrants. Um, so I'll share a little bit about that, but um, and I think we have time for questions at the end, so we can wait until then for that. Um, as I said, the Colibri Center is a nonprofit with the mission to end disappearance and uphold human dignity on the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and our work is a mix of uh, advocacy, forensic science, um, and community organizing and emotional support for families. I'll talk a little bit more about our programs later, but we started as a small volunteer-run project in 2006, um, essentially collecting missing persons reports uh, from families who were searching for missing loved ones in the efforts to identify the increasing number of remains being found in the Sonoran Desert borderlands. Um, and since then, we've grown into an enormous four-person nonprofit um, <laughs> that still takes missing persons reports. Um, several come in every day, and we've expanded to add a DNA program as well as support and solid solidarity networks for families who have cases with us. <coughs> I'd also first like to center the families that we work with before I say anything else about the political context and the history of what's happening on the border. Because I think oftentimes, the, as I mentioned at the beginning, the humanity of those that we work with and those most directly impacted by a militarized and violent border uh, is forgotten. These are photos of different uh, chapters of the Family Network, which is the program that I coordinate. Um, so these are all relatives looking for missing loved ones, some of whom disappeared weeks ago, some of whom have been missing for decades um, in cities across the country. Uh, they come together every couple of months to, to support each other. So I would really just like us to, to remember all of those impacted before we go any further. So there's a multi-layered, heartbreaking, invisibilized, unrelenting, and ultimately very, very preventable human rights crisis happening on our border every single day. Since 1998, over 7,200 people have lost their lives crossing the border. And I would like to frame this statistic by saying that these are only remains that have been recovered. So we estimate that it's thousands and thousands more. Um, this is also a statistic from Border Patrol, and that's the only source of unified information of border-wide statistics, um, the reliability of which is very questionable. And they're serious. On the, as a result of multiple FOIA requests, there are multiple kind of reasons to suspect that this is actually a very underrepresented number. Of those, almost 3,000 have died in southern Arizona. Those, that number is from the Office of the Medical Examiner in uh, Pima County. Those are the number of remains that have been found along the border. Um, over 3,500 people have, submitting, have submitted missing persons reports to Colibri um, to report their missing loved ones. And at this moment, uh, about 10 minutes south of here in the medical examiner's office, there are over 1,000 remains of people that are still unidentified, um, meaning tens of thousands of relatives and friends of these people who are left in agony not knowing what happened to that person. Um, this ultimately... Uh, this is not an accident. Um, this is the result of a very particular history and design of politics meant to deter migration um, and ultimately through structural and state violence. So 
what we've seen over the last 25 years is a rapid increase in the number of deaths and disappearances on our border, and our analysis is that this is a direct result of multiple kind of uh, a confluence of multiple factors rooted in a new strategy by d the Department of Homeland Security and Border Patrol starting in the mid-1990s called Prevention Through Deterrence. This is a phrase that has gotten a lot more traction uh, lately through the family separation crisis, which is still happening. Um, before these, it was sort of an obscure term, but I think now it's, it's more commonly used and people understand that most of this country's uh, anti-migration policies are justified on the basis of deterrence, that if we impose harsh enough restrictions on those coming into this country, then they'll just decide not to come. What that is is an incredibly short-sighted and superficial understanding of the reasons why people choose to migrate and the forces pushing them northward, much of which uh, is a direct result of US foreign intervention in the countries that they're coming from. So prevention through deterrence, um, this is actually a snapshot, it might be kind of hard to see for people in the back, but this is actually a snapshot of the Border Patrol's strategic plan from 1994, which has sort of set the stage for all of their um, uh, strategizing and uh, all the militari militarization that we've seen since. The idea was that, I'm gonna show a map really quickly before going back. Up until 1994, there were the primary corridors for migration into the US were through major ports of entry. So Ciudad Juarez, El Paso, Ambos Nogales, um, Tijuana, San Diego, so people would come through cities. They would come through actual ports of entry. And the idea was starting under the Clinton administration, oh, sorry, I meant to mention this at the beginning. This is something that is not a Republican agenda. This is a bipartisan US government uh, uh, philosophy and strategy. So I want us to get beyond party politics to recognize this is embedded in our entire political system. Um, but this began in 1994 by closing and making more difficult entry through those ports of entry. And the idea being that given that the desert landscape is so harsh, uh, and has, as particularly in the summer months, that people would understand the dangers inherent in trying to cross through these more remote landscapes and thus would be deterred from trying to cross. It's also important to recognize the third bullet point here that it was planned and anticipated that violence would increase as the effects of this strategy were felt. It was understood that this would lead to a more violent border, a more dangerous border, and ultimately a more deathly border. But of course, because the reasons for which people migrate did not change, people continued to migrate, um, and it just meant that they had to cross through more and more dangerous areas. This is part of a broader trend that you all are familiar with of, of the rampant, uh, the, the rapid ramp up in the militarization of our border. This is a um, bar graph of the number of border patrol agents since 1992. And it's hard to see, but basically it's gone from 4,000 to over 21,000 um, in the course of about 25 years. Border patrol agents are not the only uh, manifestations of what has become uh, an architecture and a system of death and disappearance. There's the wall, there is surveillance technology, there are drones. Um, if you all are spending any time closer to the border, or you may have already witnessed it so far, it's, it's uh, present in everyday life in Southern Arizona. And ultimately, this militarization uh, and its most drastic consequences leads to death and disappearance. And I wanted to share with you all a quote from Agnes Calamar, who's a special rapporteur to the United Nations for uh, a, com a working committee on the death and disappearance of migrants. And she lays out a, how the United States is systematically violating international law by designing an anti-migration policy that arbitrarily deprives people of their right to life. So our government is on a daily basis violating international law by intentionally designing a system that deters and kills. And I would, I would echo words that Leah shared earlier, um, that not only is it people who are coming for the first time who fall prey to this system, but also people who have lived here their entire lives, people who are deported, who then lose their lives in the attempt to cross the border again, because deportation is truly, is truly deadly. This graph shows the number of deaths, um, the number of remains examined by the medical examiner's office in Tucson starting in 1990 and through 2016. And I would point to the jump starting in 2000 when it went from about 
um, 19 every year to 71, and then again uh, in 2002 when it went up to 160, and since then it's been an average about 155 a year. There's a project called the Map of Migrant Mortality run by Arizona Open GIS that has tracked uh, the locations of where all of these deaths have occurred. And I would encourage you all to visit this website. Um, I think the spatial representation of this crisis shows that the border is not a line in the sand. The border goes far north from here and the impacts of, of death and disappearance are not located exclusively on this fine line that separates us from our southern neighbor. It's the map of migrant mortality from Arizona Open GIS. So what are we doing about it in the face of uh, a dehumanizing and disappearing and deadly border? So Colibri has four primary programs, uh, the Missing Migrants Project, the DNA Program, the Family Network, and Historias y Recuerdos. The Missing Migrants Project and the DNA Program are uh, the heart of our work. So that's where we collect missing persons reports from families who are searching for missing loved ones. Um, and then for those who are related closely enough to the person who disappeared, which means brothers and sisters, parents and children, we invite them to uh, sample their DNA, which we then compare against the DNA that's been sampled of those thousand plus remains that are still in the medical examiner's office. Uh, sometimes cases are resolved within weeks. Um, as I mentioned, there are several families who've been searching since the early 1970s and still haven't had any answers. The Family Network and Historias de Recuerdos are uh, more on the advocacy and community building side of our work. Um, so the Family Network is a community of mutual support and solidarity among those who are searching for missing loved ones on the border. Um, and that consists of different local groups in cities across the United States, um, as well as digital networks that connect folks across the Americas and in spaces of support as, as everyone navigates um, a, very, um, a very difficult search process. Many of the families we work with are not only grappling with the deep trauma of a missing loved one, but also continued extortion, um, concerns about documentation status in this country. I mean, the list goes on and on. Historias de Recuerdos is a oral history and testimony gathering project that seeks to center the voices of those most impacted by this crisis on the border and to humanize the families who are searching for their missing loved ones. And I'll talk a little bit about this in a, in a second. Um, how am I doing on time? I don't wanna. All right, I'm gonna skip through this. This is a little bit more about our DNA process, but essentially what happens is a family reports a missing person to us via Facebook, phone, email, in person. We follow up with an hour and a half long intake interview that addresses everything from the circumstances of the person's disappearance. So for example, uh, where were they crossing when? What were their plans? Were they crossing with anyone? Do you have contact with those people? To forensically relevant information, like did they have any fillings in their teeth? Had they ever broken a bone? Um, did they have any unique tattoos on their bodies. Um, some of the identifications we make rely on those unique physical um, traits. I'll end with the families. I'm, I'm sorry this is sort of rushed. I wish we could take a little bit more time, but um, I want to close by asserting that in addition to the narrative that we're barraged with daily about the um, the criminal immigrant, there's also from the kind of liberal media, this narrative of like the helpless, um, oppressed, just like battered immigrant. And I would really resist that narrative and challenge you all to see the families that we work with as very active agents in the search for justice for their families. These are people who travel across the country, across the border, looking for their loved ones. There are people who go to um, all the hospedajes along the border in northern Mexico asking if anyone has seen their family. They file missing persons reports everywhere. They film videos. They talk to press. These are not people who are, who are just sitting and crying every single day over the loss of their loved one, but people who, are, who have taken it upon themselves to, to seek the truth and answers that they need. 
So to close, I want to share a couple of brief stories. Um, this is Camarina Santa Cruz, um, and her son Marco Antonio disappeared five years ago. He lived in Nogales his entire life, just across the border in Mexico. Um, and after a messy divorce with his family, he entered into a deep depression um, and was suicidal. And the only thing that he uh, could see as a way out of this was coming to be with his mother, Camarina, who lives in Tucson. For that, he crossed the border alone and disappeared, and Camarina hasn't heard from him in five years. This is Felix Jacinto Gomez and his brother Pablo. Um, Pablo is from Guatemala, uh, and in July of this year, he crossed into the United States for the first time. Um, Pablo didn't hear, uh, Felix didn't hear anything from him, uh, and three weeks later, he was actually identified through circumstantial evidence at Colibri. In those three weeks, Felix received over 25 extortion calls asking for thousands of dollars from people who claimed to uh, have his brother hostage. And finally, this is Irma Carrillo Nevarez, who is searching for her two children, Yadira and Julio, who disappeared in 1998. Um, Yadira was pregnant with uh, Irma's what was to be Irma's first grandchild. And Irma testified a month ago at a commission before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights about deaths and disappearances on the border. Um, and this is her showing a picture of her heart with two holes in it that can't be filled uh, as the absence of her, her children. Um, I'll close by making an ask of you all. Um, it's really important that we invite and engage all of you into the work of narrative change around migration and immigrants in this country. And Colibri has just launched a campaign called the Vuelvanlos, or Bring Them Back, uh, in an effort to start doing this. Um, we just launched a new website called bringthembackcampaign.org that features testimonies from families that we work with along, as, along with a living memorial of photos and names and ages of people who have disappeared. And I would really invite you all to share this with your networks. Um, as Leah said, I would love to be in touch with all of you to talk about ways that we can collaborate on projects that seek to humanize and engage people who have been so invisibilized and erased but who are ultimately very active uh, and engaged in, in their searches. Um, so I'll close there, and I guess we can move into questions and answers now. But thank you all again for giving us this chance to share our work with you. Yeah, I, I don't know how, we, go ahead. Uh, very few. Yes, so the question was essentially what are the repercussions for the United States government's systematic violation of international humanitarian law in this case? Um, and in the case of the border, which is what I can speak to, um, very few. And I, so I, I showed the, the photo of the Inter-American Commission hearing. There have been hearings in the United Nations to talk about arbitrary deaths and disappearances caused by border policies, and Leah can speak maybe to the, the component of immigrant detention. Um, but essentially, it boils down to sort of the strongly worded condemnation, which ultimately does very little, which is why we've uh, decided to move from towards centering family voices and appealing to the kind of uh, human emotional component of the actual individual people who, in who are in charge of these policies. So that meant in this case with um, the Inter-American Commission, holding up all of the photos and names of people who have disappeared uh, as the representatives of the United States government, like um, the people in charge of the FBI's forensic unit spoke, which led them to agree to starting a group to compare the forensic information that the United States have with um, the information that we have. So it's a roundabout way of answering your question by saying that there's very little, and ultimately you have to fight for these small victories uh, by using 
and but continually use this condemnation via international law as a somewhat legitimizing foundation to to structure what you're saying. But yeah, I wish it, I wish there were more enforcement mechanisms, but there just there really aren't. I don't know. If you yeah. Um, I can't speak much to international law, but I know that written into our immigration policy are what I think most people would identify as basic human rights abuses. Um, and in the way that it's enacted are the things that are not written into it, protections that are not written into our immigration justice system, such as a public defender, um, such as that families cannot be separated, um, result in uh, immense trauma being inflicted on folks who come to this country seeking um, a safer life um, or seeking opportunities. Um, I will say that, so for example, one thing that we really learned this summer with the family separation crisis um, that some of you may or may not be aware of, but was very publicly in the news, um, families have been separated by our immigration policy for centuries. Um, but this summer, we saw family separation in a way that we hadn't been seeing it very frequently before, which is that um, as a result of the of Just Sessions' no toler zero tolerance policy, um, parents and children who arrived at the border together um, ended up being separated in border pat patrol custody and sent to different ice holding facilities without any tracking of parent-child relationships, which resulted in babies being held in detention, babies representing themselves in court. Um, and what we saw was that even with the executive order to end family separation, family separation continues. Um, and the only thing that has provided any sort of accountability is public awareness of the of what's actually happening in our detention facilities. So I'm very, very grateful for the public outcry around family separation that has resulted in less frequent separation of parents and children. Although I will say that the numbers of families that were separated and the families that we saw represented in the news do not even near the quantity or different types of families that are separated on a daily basis at our border. Um, but what we did see was that the community rose in support and there is now um, community leaders like the Florence Project, like the ACLU, like Kids in Need of Defense coming together to ensure that on an individual level there is justice for these people. And then on a wider community level through elections, people have um, uh, people are getting to cast their vote right now for what is and isn't um, fair. Um, so I really think that community awareness of um, of the human rights violations are the way towards accountability. Yeah, we have a question. Yeah, Um, I would emphasize, yes, sorry, um, the question was, and let me know if I'm paraphrasing this all right, um, how, given that you all come from across the country and that you're not all from a borderlands region, how can you uh, raise awareness about the local implications of this border policy and kind of put pressure on your local represent or your elected representatives, is that, did I get that right, or what can be done? Okay. Right. What can we do on a national level to address these policies? Um, I think the first step is showing that uh, what's happening on the border is not border is not confined to the border. I think that we have to remind people about this in Coley Bree's work all the time that the families we work with live in every city, every town every part of this country. This is not that 
everything that happens related to immigration happens 60 miles south of here um, in a little line. So I think that's where you all as artists come in to show, especially you all who are engaged in very community grounded work in the different places around the country that you come from, showing that our, the, these are community members that we live alongside, they're people who uh, we have a civic responsibility to stand in solidarity with. Um, I agree with Leah. I mean, I'm, I frankly am quite disillusioned about the possibility of national policy change uh, by pursuing a legislative agenda right now. And I think what we can do is really engage in the kind of hearts and minds cultural change work by showing that uh, immigration is everywhere and that not doing like, we are all, we are all immigrants, we're all, but I mean seriously, like we all have a responsibility to people in our communities because the families that we're talking about are families that live very close to all of you. Um, I will say that there are, on the legislative end, there are certain promising inroads. Um, Senators Cornyn and Harris uh, are working with uh, migrant justice groups on the border on uh, unproposed legislation about demilitarization and, and preventing border deaths and disappearance, which is heartening, but it's been several years that they've uh, or it's been two years now. Um, there have also been expressed commitments on behalf of representatives uh, like Ann Kirkpatrick to convene working groups um, in Washington, D.C. She's, sorry, she's a congressional candidate for Southern Arizona to convene uh, migration working groups in Washington uh, in the likelihood that she's elected. So there are promising inroads, but I really think the work that we all have to do is showing that uh, the border is everywhere, um, and it's our responsibility to uplift stories. Because like Leah said, it, it really was the kind of immense public outcry that threw some sand in the gears of the machine of family separation. So that's, I think, what we have to be working on now. Um, and just, I've been said that so eloquently, and just to add on to that specifically about immig immigrant detention, detention is everywhere too. Uh, we have a lot of um, immigrants detained in the state of Arizona, a really, really large amount, but there's, and I forget the website, but I can send it um, later on, and maybe that can get sent out to all of you, but there is a website that maps all of the places where um, folks are detained in immigrant detention facilities around the country, and they're in almost every state. Um, so I, I also want to say that as I'm saying like tell the stories tell the stories it's really important that if you have a platform to share the stories they're the stories of actual individuals who want to share those stories with you so if you're in a state and you can find out where the immigration detention center is and you can find out what organizations are advocating for folks in immigrant detention and you want to share their stories there are visitation programs um, you can support organizations like the Florence Project in other states that are going in there and meeting with individuals and um, actively lifting up their stories that are being suppressed. I just want to say one more thing. Um, I guarantee that everywhere that you all come from, there are at least a few groups doing really great work locally um, to uphold immigrant justice, and I would really recommend that you all reach out to them. Because while both of us work at organizations with a national reach, ultimately we are know most intimately our own local context, and the peop there are people in your communities who will know better kind of these these efforts so Oh yeah Totally Yeah, thank you all. Uh, so we're going to move into the panel portion, uh, which is going to give you an introduction both to Tucson in general and also an orientation around the All Souls procession. And our intention was really to try to, as you all do with your work, as, as we do at NET, uh, to really try to provide for you 
a range of voices with different perspectives on the same subject matter um, so that we can sort of hear how different people are thinking about the same thing. Um, I'm going to turn over to you. Jerry Stropnicki is moderating this panel for us. Jerry is a uh, NET co-founder. He's also a member of the board currently. Uh, and as I was thinking about, um, gosh, I need somebody from the NET community as an outsider who is really deeply rooted in community storytelling about place to help ask questions and be sort of a stand-in for all of us with a panel, you can see why I ended up where we did. So, Mr. Jerry Stropnicki. Thank you. Is this on, this thing on? How are we doing? That was some really, an amazing set of presentations. My heart is full. I know yours is too. Um, I don't want to leave that. I don't want to like leave that. But we we're going to move on to some other complex conversations. So why don't we all just stand up for a moment? All right. I'd like you to close your eyes. Take one deep breath in and out. <sighs> Open your eyes. Take another deep breath in and out. And with consent, find a point of contact with someone near you, some sort of point of contact. Let someone else in. Together, take a deep breath in. And out. And one more just for you. In and out. And sit down. And let's thank the universe that there are people doing good work. All right, um, we are, we are uh, short of time, so I'm going to uh, change the <laughs> carefully negotiated instruction. I'm going to ask all of my panelists to come up to the table, and then we're going we're gonna to hear a bit for a moment about Tucson from two experts who live here. Then we're going to get a preview with some complex conversation around um, the All Souls procession that we will begin experiencing tonight. We're behind. That complex conversation is going to be just a beginning. We will not finish it here. <laughs> we will not finish it this weekend. But we're going to keep going. Um, just a little, just a, 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 a short story about me. I work in a lot of communities. But this is, uh, I've done a project or projects in the coal fields um, uh, uh, dealing with you know, exploitation and environmental damage and opioids in the Appalachian, Eastern Kentucky. I've also done projects in a Pennsylvania community sitting atop the Marcellus Shale, which suddenly got 2,000 fracking wells in the Appalachian Mountains of Pennsylvania. Both are right. Both are quite sure the other is wrong. So I want, and, and as I enter, as I enter into community, we have to put aside our assumption. We have to enter with a point of view of, of learning and understanding and humility. And we have to enter with, um, with respect and open hearts and a desire never to damage. Are we good with that? Good. OK. Um, that said, uh, I think we're gonna, we have a couple presentations first from um, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves because I'm not going to presume to do that. These are amazing scholars and artists and community organizers as a group, all from right here. So uh, Maribel Alvarez and Debbie Chase, uh, maybe? Is it maybe? Definitely. Maybe. I could have said <laughs> maybe. Uh, it's, may it's definitely maybe. Um, so I'm going to hand it to them for the first part of this, which is an overview of Tucson, after which uh, we're going to do. Uh, we're going to be talking about the All Souls procession, which we're all going to experience the rest of this weekend. You all ready? Yes. Here you go. Thank you so much. Welcome to our beautiful city. How many of you come from uh, out of Arizona, outside Arizona? Oh, oh wow. <laughs> all right, great. Welcome and uh, bienvenidos. How many of you came from uh, Tempe, Phoenix? Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, so we. We decided that we don't want to take a lot of time from the rest of the conversation. Time is running fast, so we're going to just share some factoids 
about two songs that are important and meaningful to us. Um, Debbie will go a little bit deeper into the particular cultural community. She, uh, she lives and experiences and is building here. Uh, behind us, you're going to be seeing images of uh, Tucsonans, everyday Tucsonans, and does a project we do at the Folklife Festival here called Faces of the Festival. And these are portrait studio photos that we to take at the festival, and people give us consent to use them with their stories. So you're going to be seeing behind us faces of um, everyday Tucsonans that are not here, but who agree to photographs. Uh, so Tucson is, uh, first of all, the ancestral land of the Tohono O'odham people. Um, the name Tucson is um, a Tohono O'odham derived word. Um, call is really to be Tukshon, and uh, Tukshon is um, a specific site here in town. Um, is it means uh, the base of the Black Mountain. And it's right here, uh, close to downtown, at the base of the, the Santa Cruz River. Uh, used to have water, and, uh, and run run through the middle of town, um, and serve as a, a main area of establishment for many many communities, including the Autumn people. Uh, the Tohono Autumn Nation is uh, one of the second largest reservation in land of Native people in the United States, other than the Navajo, and it's the size of the state of Connecticut. Um, and um, it's um, an important, important community that uh, has a, a feel and a presence in Tucson in many ways, including the desert, which you, I think some of you experience, and the mighty Sahuaro, which is the uh, unique ecological region in the world, the Sonoran Desert that extends uh, all the way to the Gulf of um, Cortez in, in Baja. And um, it's also the, the colonization here began around the 1600s. Uh, it took a little bit later, longer than the rest of Mexico because it was really hard to get up here. Uh, the north was very distinct and separated and it created a Norteño culture, <laughs> which is very independent and very entrepreneurial and very sort of like, you had to be really brave to come all the way up to the north. And the Spanish uh, colonizing apparatus took them a while the railroad came a little bit later here than in many other parts, so you had a very sort of a unique lab for the creation of uh, what some scholars years ago used to call the Norteño personality, uh, a sense of independence, fierce independence. Uh, some of the tribes that were, were here, including the Autumn people and the Opatas in Sonora, were agriculturalists. So they took very, very well, not because they were passive, uh, but because they, they saw some benefits to some of the crops that the Spanish introduced, including wheat. So Sonora, uh, our state, neighboring state, is uh, the, one of the largest wheat growing region in Mexico, and that's why we have flour tortillas here. Uh, large flour tortillas because the wheat that grew in this particular part, which is now heritage wheat, we know as Sonora white, uh, also had incredible level of elasticity uh, in, this, in, the, in the seed. So it allowed for you to stretch those tortillas in, in a big way, and that becomes sort of an emblematic sign of Tucson. Um, some of the other tribes were not so <laughs> friendly. In fact, it has some, uh, this region contained two of the fiercest resistors to um, colonialism in the history of colonialization in Mexico, and that um, was the Apaches and the Yaqui people in Sonora. So they, uh, it, it was hostile territory for Spaniards for a long time and many others to come because of these two groups which resisted colonization and in some ways still do. Um, there are 23 federal recognized tribes in Arizona, <laughs> uh, more than in any other place. Uh, it's also the site of the Colorado River, of course, and that's a big thing because the Colorado River is not just the site of the Grand Canyon, but it's also what allowed a lot of the development of the control of water policy um, that allowed the imagined uh, expansion of, you see, sun cities and things like that on the sun belt. So the, the, the really the colonization of water uh, has been a big topic. Um, this is the land of the vaqueros. We invented cowboys. <laughs> um, this is cattle country. Uh, wheat and cattle country, um, so we do the, the typical meal of a barbecue for Sonorans and Tucsonenses would be a carne asada, uh, that's grilled steak, <laughs> or 
with uh, flour tortillas and um, chile salsa for a little, little tiny chili we call chiltepin. Um, in just a couple other things, uh, the University of Arizona is one of the first uh, land grant universities. It's established in the 1800s, immediately after um, uh, the proclamation of um, the abolition of slavery and the President Lincoln moved very quickly to establish land grants university, which were meant for the training and education of uh, farmers, the children of farmers. The University of Arizona is a land grant university. And then there were layer migrations, as we will see and speak today. We have a large Chinese population with a lot of history here, African American communities, which uh, Debbie will talk about. So we have a large Jewish community. And we have a lot of ethnic whites that migrated, uh, particularly from the um, Appalachians south and also from the northern states. We have a very unique population in our town known as snowbirds. And uh, these are folks who come here to avoid the winter, the really harsh winters in the north. Um, we have, uh, because of that, we have a lot of newcomers to Arizona that um, don't understand a lot of the, the, the history, so there's, but they also bring some level of wealth. Um, Tucson um, is also a sort of a, a politically progressive uh, area in some ways. It's a, the greatest paradox is that we have incredible social movements here, including the sanctuary movement that was birthed here in the 1980s to aid uh, as, uh, the Central American migration from the Central American War that we, this country waged against Central America in the 80s, a church base, uh, people who provided asylum and help uh, resisted federal immigration policy. And that is in contrast to the fact that Tucson is also, the Tucson sector is ground zero for the largest number of arrest and um, immigration and uh, law enforcement build up, um, mil low scale or middle scale militarization. And lastly, I think I will say, and, uh, and I think my colleagues here, these are all, we're all friends and collaborators in many ways. It's a very rich cultural community. Um, it's a community with an incredible tradition of uh, festivals. Uh, at any point of the year, almost any time, you will see some sort of outdoor celebration. Last time I counted 60. <laughs> uh, and that includes anything from sports related, like El Tour de Tucson, which is a bicycle run, to uh, the festival I direct, which is one of the oldest folk life festivals in the country, to some meet yourself, model after the American uh, folk life festival in na uh, national at the Smithsonian. That festival's been going on since 74, our festival here, and lots of incredible uh, collaborations, including some um, really remarkable literary production in this community. Um, we used to have some pretty famous authors be part of us and our community and actually develop uh, literary works of great importance here in Tucson, including the first Native American Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, Scott Momaday, and so forth and so on. So uh, it, that's just a little bit of factoids of Tucson. And that's kind of fun. So I'm going to stop there and let you ask questions later. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Nothing better than having a folklorist, right? <laughs> if you want multiple perspective and lots of understanding. Why don't we pass that mic over for Debbie? And uh, it's Debbie's turn, more on Tucson from another okay. perspective. Uh, and then after that, we move into the All Souls discussion. Good afternoon. I'm Debbie Chess, maybe, definitely, right between yes and no. <laughs> um, so one of the most interesting things about the, uh, well, a little bit about me. I moved here eight years ago from Chicago. Um, and one of the first things I noticed when I landed in Tucson is the lack of a very clear presence of African Americans in, in not only Tucson, but the, the Southwest. But that turned out to be a very, that was a kind of a facade of what is really happening um, in the black community in Tucson. And so um, when I first moved here, I started working with the Loft Cinema as their director of development and community outreach and then were, was the executive director of the Arts Foundation here. And then got an appointment with the University of Arizona and working under Maribel here um, as a community impact fellow with community engagement in the School of so uh, Social and Behavioral Sciences. And in that role, I um, am shepherding forward one of my uh, many um, jobs is shepherding forward 
the re-envisioning uh, and re-resurrection of a, of a facility called the Dunbar Pavilion. Um, how many from Tucson here are familiar with the Dunbar? And so, can you? so um, the Dunbar was the originally the first the segregated school in Tucson, built in 1918. Um, it was the the school was actually first um, established as the colored school for children in 1913, and was um, was on Fourth Avenue, not far from where we are here, um, in a bakery in someone's home. And then the uh, the facility was built on at three. 25 West 2nd Street in the heart of the Dunbar Spring neighborhood um, and called the, the Paul Lawrence Dunbar School. So every child from the age, uh, from first grade to eighth grade was educated in this facility. Um, and then it was purchased, it was closed down. Uh, I also wanna say a, a structure right next to it was built in 1948 to accommodate a, ju a junior high school as the population got larger of children going there got larger. And it too was named the Paul Lawrence Dunbar Junior High School. So in 1952, 1951, the state of Arizona handed down the desegregation order. And um, our superintendent at the time decided that in order to ease our community into, or, or to, to kind of reflect this new vision, this new progressive vision of desegregation, they were going to change the name of the school to erase all um, leftover, any vestige of desegregation in this community. So they named the school the John Spring Junior High School. Um, and the, if you, it, depending on who you ask, the, the real story is that white parents refused to let their children go to a school named after a black poet. And so they demanded that the name of the school be changed. And it was. And so there are now, there are um, alumni still alive that, go, that went to the school um, that we will do not acknowledge the John Springs School. It is the Dunbar Junior High School and the whole facility is the Dunbar Pavilion. So it was closed in 1978, boarded up by, Tuc by um, Tucson Unified School District, um, doing shift of demographics and, and changing. Um, and so it sat abandoned uh, for many years. The Neighborhood Association in the Dunbar Spring neighborhood uh, wanted the buildings um, torn down because of broken out windows, there's a lot of drug activity, crime activity. A group of alumni, um, Dunbar alumni, said no, that, that holds too much history, too much black history um, for it to be torn down. So they formed something called the Dunbar Coalition and it was made up of the Tucson Urban League, the Juneteenth Committee. Who, who here is familiar with Juneteenth? Oh, that's so good to see. Many people don't, many, many people don't. Um, and so the Juneteenth Committee, uh, the Buffalo Soldiers Association, the Dunbar alumni got together, formed a nonprofit, and purchased the buildings um, in 1995 for $25 from Tucson Unified School Districts. Now this represents 55,000 square feet of property sitting on two and a half acres. Of built of facility that runs on from Maine and Oracle. For those of you who don't know that, it's a major thoroughfare from down from almost South Tucson to the foothills, and so um, we have a community garden there. There's a commercial kitchen right now. It's um, has house uh, houses uh, so, uh, an idea school, a private school is there. Uh, Barbia Williams Dance Cent Dance um, Center is there. The Visual and Textile Arts of Tucson and Corey Press. Um, Mari Bell sp spoke of the great literary work. Corey Press is a is a organization here that that um, highlights the work of um, um, LGBT transgender people of color. Um, and so and the bar the Tucson uh, the Dunbar Barber Academy, which is the largest 
Barber Academy in the Southwest graduates the most barbers in the Southwest. And so all of that is housed in the Dunbar Pavilion now, but we still have a lot of work to do and a long way to go, and, and Maribel is my ally, and many of the people here are my allies and making that happen. Okay, so um, one of the, the most important things to, to think about in terms of the black community here is that the real growth and shift in, in the black community af is actually African immigrant, uh, the African immigrant population here. And um, so one of the ways that we look at, at how we tell our stories is, is in, in incorporating that in what it is to be black in Tucson because the real, um, uh, the, the population, the demographics is less than 8% here in Tucson of those that are black identified. Um, we are, um, we're battling a clock, which I hate, because I want to sit here and I want to listen and I want to learn. Um, so anyway, right now we're going to shift to the second part of this, which is to look at All Souls. And so we need to shift the video to uh, the All Souls video. Mm -hmm. um, team, we have uh, about 35 minutes. I hope they enjoy the images. Yeah, did you like the images? <laughs> Let's hear it for the people of Tucson. Um, really beautiful. So um, the way this is good. I'm going to take a, a, a permission poll here, actually. You bet. That 35 minutes. So uh, you have a two-hour lunch break. You do have to relocate from here to other places. Um, but I feel like this is your choice. You know, whether you would you rather have 15 minutes left for lunch at your yes. location or 15 minutes more here? Yeah. Okay. Um, those of you who are trying to sit down in rounds, I'm going to call those places just so that it's clear that we so, Alicia, how much more time we have? Let me do 15 more minutes. We love you. <laughs> Which means we can restore to our, our previous plans. We can, <laughs> we can restore to our previous plan. But um, what's going to happen is we're going to see a, a video. We're going to hear a three to five minute introduction from each panelist. You should know that we came up with a signaling system because we wanted to make sure all voices were heard. And so when we get into the the later discussion, which is just going to be a panel discussion, you will see me giving this when they have a minute left and this when it's wrap. And that's to be fair, not for me to assert my white male straight privilege. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you know, we have to acknowledge what's there. So we're going to start, um, I think our order is Adam and then Rachel and then Sarah, right? And then um, we'll, we'll hear again from the folks we've just heard from. And, uh, and then we'll go into a, a panel discussion here followed by questions and answers. When we get to questions and answers, if you all start holding the stage too long, you get the same, <laughs> right? Because we're, real, we're smart people in this room. These are good, good people. It's not that I don't want to hear you. I just want to hear everybody. And we do that by agreement and rule, okay? So, yes, Maribel. I realize that I, I never liked the art to be anonymous. Uh, so the photos were taken by Steven Meckler, who's a local photographer, and the project Faces of the Festival is done by Kimi Isel, who's sitting in the audience with you. So I didn't, I didn't want to be anonymous on those. Never too little time for acknowledgement of artists. Um, so we saw Adam's work last night. He will introduce himself. Uh, the question that folks have before them for this part is just tell a little bit about yourself and how you entered the All Souls procession or chose not to enter the All Souls procession. Um, and here we go. Adam, it's all yours. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Adam Cooper Teran. Um, I'm wearing my All Souls procession hat for now um, for this panel. I'm the artistic director, lead coordinator for the Ancestors Project, which is one of the projects within the All Souls procession weekend. Some of the images that you're seeing right now are from the event from various years documenting the different aspects of the projects that are beyond just what the procession is, which is a, a massive procession of over a thousand, 100,000 people that walk in the streets of Tucson every year. Um, I had more images that I wanted to show. There was another video of stuff. I, I feel like it's best to maybe just give a brief context of somewhat 
some of the history of the All Souls procession, um, what it led to being this big event that happens every year downtown, um, and now on the west side of Tucson. Um, basically, the event is a, is a public ceremony, ceremony honoring and celebrating the dead. Um, it started in 1990 with a local artist, Susan Johnson, who uh, was grieving the death of her father and created a, a performance art piece um, out of her studio, inviting very select few friends and musicians of hers and created sort of a ritual ceremony performance honoring and celebrating her father's death. Um, doing it through very, her, her very artistic practices and in collaboration with other artists. The following year, um, that moved out of the studio and became a walk through her neighborhood. Um, the urge for people to want to honor and celebrate their own dead became sort of uh, adopted with that. And as the years progressed, um, more people just kept coming and walking within the, uh, the, the Dunbar Springs neighborhood, which is where her studio was based. Um, after probably about the fourth or fifth year, um, several hundred people were walking through downtown proper beyond the neighborhood, cutting through Fourth Avenue, down Congress, and usually ending at the Franklin Street docks or what used to be one of the uh, other warehouses that was on Stone and Sixth Avenue. Uh, I'm sorry, Stone and Sixth Street. Um, and usually these, uh, these endings and finales would, would entail working with a lot of different other performance groups. Uh, um, ultimately, the capacity uh, of the event growing um, required some kind of organizational uh, foundation to support it. And Many Mouths, One Stomach became the organization to support that, um, taking on uh, applying for funds every year through the Arts Foundation, uh, Arizona Commission on the Arts, NEA funds. Um, but the bulk of the, of the funding would come each year from just donations from the public. It's a very grassroots driven project that um, for, for all the years that it's been growing more, um, it's reached a capacity now of, of uh, almost 150,000 people. Within that, um, there was a lot of uh, discussions around how to make the event something that was inclusive for everybody. So there was a lot of room for people to participate and even as a, as a spectator, there was always a, an invitation where you don't just need it. There's no boundaries within the parade. You can be watching on the street and then just jump right in and walk the rest of the way if you wanted. Or you could step out and watch again from another vantage point. But the beauty of the event and I think the spiritual power of the event um, is in this way of, of allowing the public a space to be able to come in and, and not just be a, an observer, that they can participate directly. And not just through walking, there was plenty of these other workshops that were set up in the, in the years uh, that we've been doing this with different uh, other groups, like Tucson Puppet Works was a big uh, group that uh, would, would have workshops months leading up to the event where they would allow people to come and make uh, big head puppets in, in, in image of, uh, in, in representation of their ancestors or their loved ones. Uh, I've seen people make big um, uh, floats of their dogs, <laughs> of their pets, uh, that they walk through the parade. Um, people make altars along the street. Um, people walk with photos of their loved ones. The Ancestors Project, as its own project, allows anyone to submit photos um, in the months leading up to the event. I collect those photos and we digitally project them at the finale site on large buildings. We used to do it more along the downtown route, but now it's pretty much focused to the finale site. Um, and then there's the urn, which is a large vessel that was created um, as another way that the public can participate by putting the names of their loved ones or things that they want to let go of or release or uh, process that they leave in this urn, that gets t walked through the parade and then at the finale site it gets elevated and burned in front of 100,000 people. Um, that's those, the ancestors and the, and the urn are kind of like the legacy projects of what the, of, of what the procession is. It's evolved so much over the years and that it's grown so much and that it's in integrated so many different kinds of people, so many different communities, so many different cultures of people. It's a big smorgasbord of, of a lot of representation. 
Um, I know we're going to get into the delicate conversation of appropriation too, which is something that we've been um, addressing more frequently over the last few years, simply because the event is so big. And depending on what angle and what the optics are of how you're looking at it or engaging the procession, um, can be seen from a lot of different angles. And some of those angles um, can be problematic. Some of them can also be very empowering and very enlightening um, in the ways that I've experienced uh, directly how people have engaged the procession, how they've submitted the photo of their loved one and they see it projected really large. I've seen the effect that that has on somebody. I've seen the effect of how people grieving their loved ones or their pets are, are processing their event, um, their, this, this whole process of grief. Um, and I think that just speaks more to the greater need of why people need a space to be able to grieve their loved ones, however that gets represented. Um, with the utmost sincerity and respect too, because the procession in and of itself is not a party, it's a celebration for the dead, but with that is like the ceremony and the spirit of that. So that's kind of the context I wanna give. Thank you, Adam. Uh, you, you saw some Ad Adam's work last night, you'll see more of it all through the weekend apparently. <laughs> so <laughs> um, the, the, this is a community that collaborates mm -hmm. across many different titles and organizations. And it's kind of a beautiful thing. Anyway, uh, Rachel directed one of the pieces we saw last night, and H she's a scholar, <laughs> and here she is. So um, I'm on this panel uh, from more of a performance studies scholar perspective, and I was invited to be on it because I've written several articles on the Tucson All Souls procession. But Jerry asked us to give a little introduction about how we came to the All Souls procession or, or why we are drawn to it. Um, and so my scholarship as a performance studies scholar, um, I focused for the last 17 years on the Burning Man Festival, and I wrote a book called On the Edge of Utopia, Performance and Ritual at Burning Man, and I was very interested in particular of the burning of the effigy. They have a temple that memorializes the dead. It's dedicated to suicide. Uh, it's a very grassroots event that started with 20 people on the beach, um, and I was specifically interested in fire performance and as a venue for fire arts. Um, and so when I moved to Arizona 12 years ago, I went to the Tucson All Souls procession for the f first time, and I was very really struck by a lot of the p parallels and similarities um, in terms of the 20 people starting out, very grassroots with no agenda, <laughs> just one person at Burning Man was someone grieving a broken you know, relationship, and in this case it was Susan Johnson's um, dad. Uh, and I think Burning Man and uh, the All Souls are representations of, fest of festive sites that are completely grassroots, that have no corporate sponsorship, and they are sort of have grown and evolved. Uh, 20 people, 40 people, 80 people, 100 people, up to now 100,000 people. Burning Man is now 70,000 people. And so there's something really fascinating about that. Um, but I wanted to bring up three points in terms of uh, sort of a larger macro approach to festival theory and sort of why festivals are important um, in our society. Um, so the concept of the festival palimpsest is something that I really like to think about. Um, the concept of the palimpsest, if you look at like an old building and you see like an old ad that was there and it was torn down and you see a new ad and you see all these layers of history visible on the surface if you just look past. Um, and so festivals are um, palimpsests, festival palimpsests. Every festival that exists is sort of this layering of history and memory. Um, so if you go back to the history of All Souls and All Saints Day, it's actually a, pre a pagan festival, Samhain, that you went back long before. And the, the grafting of pagan festivals into Christianity is a lot of our Christian festivals or the have been grafted from these pagan events. And then in the 16th century, with the conquistadors and coming to the conquest of the Americas, they brought over All Souls and All Saints Day to the Americas, and they encountered the Aztec, Mayan, the various festivals of the dead that were already happening here in the Americas, and the birth of Dias de los Muertos happened, right? So there's already these layerings of grafting of festival upon festival. Um, All Hallows Eve, Halloween, um, there, so, so these three festivals, like Halloween, All Souls Day, Dia de los Muertos, uh, various festivals are all happening uh, like in this three-day period um, across the Americas, in Europe, and so it's, it's an interesting to think about uh, spaces of festival palimpsest. The, the next point I want to make is um, that history of festivals is the history of appropriation. <laughs> 
there's these layers of appropriation. This is why it makes them such fascinating sites to observe and study, is to see these layers. Um, and festivals are spaces for the utopian performative. If you take Jill's Dolan of the utopian performative, she looks at it in terms of um, performance, but I look at it in terms of festival, that festivals become sites where communities imagine their ideal selves and bring themselves into being. Um, and we see these layers. Uh, they become spaces of transformation, a spaces of possibility, um, a space for shaping and forging identity through gesture, through signs, symbols. Um, also, after 9-11, um, and I talked, interviewed Nadia and Paul about this, the All Souls became um, a site for national trauma, for mourning national trauma, uh, vicarious trauma, and a place for public dissent where people could um, uh, S f uh, fight against this rally to war and say no we're not we're not interested in that we we want to mourn that we want to have a different um uh approach um and then finally the last thing i would just say is that um uh yeah just just that the importance of these public spaces for to memorialize death to to uh to, to remember the dead to gather in public spaces, and we can't lose sight of the importance of that. And why why has this event grown from 20 to 150,000? It's serving some need. Um, of course, it's, there's lots of complications that, that come with that, with appropriation, um, but just the importance of these public spaces uh, as festivals and processions offer us. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> it's a complex oh. place, complex thing about perspective. Um, uh, Sarah is an artist and community organizer, and uh, she has the microphone. Here you go. Thank you all for being here, and hi, Joe. What's up? Oh, I haven't seen them in many, many years. Uh, my name is Sarah Gonzalez. I've lived here for 20 years, but I was born and raised in Oklahoma. Um, and a few of the things I really wanted, so many things to say, but one is I also work for Mariposas Sin Fronteras, and we are a um, migrant justice group that works with queer and trans folks that are currently uh, in immigration detention and also recently released. So I just wanted to say, like, I, we like the Florence Project, but they are not the only ones doing social, social service work with migrants. Um, and it's really important to say that because queer and trans folks really get left off the radar a lot of the time. Um, and I also run my own consulting, talking about these very issues of social inequity across the country. Um, I, also <laughs> I also work at the U of A just to say um, I get the honor of being educated by my community. So at the university, I work in the cultural resource centers with um, all, all of the cultural resource centers and run a youth poetry slam in town and La Pilita Cultural Center. So because of all of those endeavors, I get to meet uh, lots of different folks and I listen to them and their stories and hear what's going on. I think um, my work that I'm very fascinated by is how do we create um, a space and an environment where we can talk about these kinds of things, where the idea is not, yes, we should do this, or no, we should not do this, but more of a both and. Uh, we should be doing this and we should be doing this, right? So what does that look like? And some of the guiding principles, what are those? And we take some from the Zapatistas, and one of them is that we have to walk and ask questions at the same time. So sometimes, <laughs> sometimes we say like, oh, you're stopping this really important work, this crisis work at the border, or this, um, all souls that's really feeding people's needs to talk about death and it's not about that it's like we can do that work and figure out what else is it that we need to be doing because we'll never get to the expert level and be very wary of people who say they are experts at anything um, so I always think about power and impact our identities we should always be saying like you know where do I have privilege I have privilege as an adult running a a youth organization and so my youth are very comfortable saying hey I don't like when you did that or what is adultism because I bring it up as a person with privilege so anytime that's in in our work we should always be talking about oh um, you know <laughs> again not a condemnation but sometimes we're so stressed that we hear that first so if we have folks talking about uh, immigration and crisis at the border and they're two white people they should say we're white people and here's why we're here because there's folks of color in our org and this is really taxing and so we do this kind of you know saying the stories and stuff so anyway how do we get there right how do we say oh that's awesome yes let's think about that more and that's the work that I'm I'm interested in I think uh, 
I sometimes people are like, Sada's real feisty, but I'm not. I just want us to all do better, right? I congratulate what we're doing and what can we do better because there's inequity that's there. And at our, our best, we will accidentally perpetuate inequity when we don't mean to. And at our worst, if we're not questioning things, then people who gain power and are never questioned and have a lot of privilege end up being the most violent of people and traumatize our community. So for all souls, um, I don't choose to participate. I have gone before, um, and there are folks in Tucson and mostly in South Tucson where there's a large uh, Mexican-American Latinx population who choose not to go because of how it's so closely related to Day of the Dead or Dia de los Muertos. Um, and so for all of those reasons of it's a sacred tradition, and even if it looks like celebration, it's still sacred, and you have people who have no idea what it is embodying that and, and buying things from Walmart, <laughs> right, or stores like that when there's lots of folks making that here locally. Um, and so folks have gone. Uh, I never tell anyone they don't they shouldn't go, but you should go and experience and, and choose for yourself. But folks that I know and love dearly who go have just this different analysis of what they want and what they need. And for them, it's just sort of things that you can't control uh, of like um, an Asian American woman that had gone and watched people dress up as dead geishas, right? So things that we run into with Halloween as well. It's like that serves to, um, at whose, we mourn, but at whose expense, right? So who gets to participate in, in those spaces? So that's what I'll start off with. <laughs> you had another 30 seconds. Oh, okay, well <laughs> then I will say, <laughs> Uh, well, just from that last 30 seconds is <laughs> what happens when there's an inaccurate uh, representation or not a representation is that um, it's a tool of dehumanization, right? And that tool is very, is very used to uh, eradicate people. So anything that we talk about within cultural appropriation, um, and then I'll say these are the four questions that I got from the Wing Luke Museum when they did an exhibit on tribal tattoos. And one is, who is running it? And it should be from the source community. Who profits from the event? Yeah. Were you invited by the source community? And is it a religious or a spiritual practice that deserves greater impact? Just a reminder for those of you with, with NET in Seattle, the Wing was one of our partners on that event. And you might have seen that information there. We're still learning, though. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to toss it to uh, um, Maribel or Debbie. Do you want to go on this? Or should we open to? Here, take it. Well, um, I wonder if, because of the time, we should also entertain some questions. Um, we, I, I, yeah. What do you think? We should probably pass that mic on. Um, but the um, time-wise, we're uh, we're good. We got about close to half an hour, thanks to the audience, uh, our participants' willingness. So I think we could go to panel discussion for about 15 minutes, and then questions for 15 minutes. Are we good with that? Well, yeah, uh, why don't you go ahead, please, 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 please. They're really, really good. <laughs> I know. Uh, who is running it? It should be the source community. Who profits from the event? Were you invited by the source community? And is it a religious or spiritual practice that deserves greater respect? So we're going to go to panel discussion now where panelists can ask each other questions. Or, um, and if that doesn't work so well, we'll get questions from you guys and we'll get responses. Um, it is important for us, all of us, to realize we're making a safe space here. And we have parachuted into this community, most of us, right? And so we don't want to damage. All these people might not agree with each other on certain topics, eh? But they work together all the time. And so we're not supposed to be the abrasive, the sandpaper. You can tell there's wisdom here. We should just listen, take it in, and before it's over, I'll, I'll offer a, a po possible tool you might use to take in the festival through the rest of the weekend, how to assess something, how to look uh, in different ways. So that said, um, there's a multiple, multiple ways to look at these things, multiple ways to look at these things. And we've heard a multiple of voices here. And I, I don't want to, I'll give this to anybody who wants it. Um, how do we keep it 
as healthy as possible, given that it's a non-curated event, and people do shit. You will see those things that, um, and, and perhaps, Adam, you know the parts of it that are curated and the parts of it that are not. Um, and maybe you can start with that. But we need to think about that and then our responsibility as artists on the long term to raise consciousness. But what parts are curated and what not? Any of the projects um, that are hosted in the months leading up to the event culminating in the uh, engagement with the urn and the ancestors project, I feel like are the most curated. The grand finale spectacle that happens at the end of the parade is another curated, curated part of that that usually entails uh, a performance with, with different groups. They usually bring a music group along too. Um, every year it's always a different group. Um, that those are kind of like the most curated aspects of it that I feel have some semblance of control. <laughs> and also, yeah, there's other parts to those that even get lost in, in the planning and preparation of it. Um, so, uh, let Rachel, could you talk about control of festival and what <laughs> that is? Oh, uh, well. Um, I think what's very unique about this festival, if you've ever seen the Macy's Day Parade or one of these big events, you know, processions or parades, uh, they're, they're highly policed and, and there's barricades. Like you're officially part of the Macy's Day Parade or you're not. Like you, you can't just jump into the Macy's Day Parade. You'll make national news if you do that. One thing that I think is really uh, powerful about the All Souls procession is the porousness of it, that people can jump in and out of the procession at any point. Um, and I think... They don't. There, there has to be some. There has to be a lot of police presence, which is just because of the nature of the people. Um, so many people gathering in one space. But the 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 notion to regulate the content. I don't know. I mean, you can probably speak to that better. But um, I mean, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. There's never been. Um, there's a there's a guide that we post um, that we spread out and educate the public around. Um, it's, it's not really telling people how to express themselves. Um, there's, this, there's this concept of like creating the, the total autonomous zone where it's like the space where people can express themselves, but because we don't police that, um, I, try, I try to leave it to uh, the intelligence and the, the sincerity and respect of people as humans to be able to kind of regulate that or check themselves. But yeah, when, when Sarita is telling a story about how someone felt like that they were being misrepresented or that the way that somebody else was representing or wanting to express themselves in the parade was an offense to them, yeah, it's challenging because we don't really hear about that until like after, if there is a debrief that involves uh, the community to talk back at us. Um, when those usually happen, um, it's like a one-time event when the way that the organizers kind of plan it. Um, it's, it's a challenge to, to try to get all of these perspectives to when people are uh, having these different experiences um, because the organization isn't very big either. It's like a handful of people sort of running it. Um, yeah. I'm going to, uh, Sarah, I'm, I'm not to put you on the spot, but um, I'm moved by the yes and that you offered. Have, have you, in your years here, seen change in this procession? And if not, what could change? And how? Um, well, I think some of it is that, I know that was a one anecdotal story, but it's the consistent story. Of like folks are like, well, I'm gonna go check it out. And then they come back like a little traumatized. Um, from it, so that's a consistent story, right? And that's what I do in my consulting work. Hey, if you want to hire me, um, <laughs> is to work with groups and say, like, 
One is how do you set structures that catches inequity before it gets to a certain level, right? And then one is how when an inequity pops up, how do you deal with it? What is that process, right? Because if we don't have a process, then it will continue to happen. And some of the stuff that Adam said, um, is important about educating. So if you're an organization, what are your values? To be very clear about what those values are. So when folks do something that's against those values, then you're like, well, we told you who we were, and like this isn't a space for you. Um, community discussions are always very helpful. Um, hiring a group of advisors that, you know, you get so busy with stuff, and you, it's good to have folks that are representative of the community kind of advising um, reflection and feedback is something that I see in all of my work that we don't do very much of because we're just going, 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 and it's finally done. We're like, great, I want to sleep. And then you're on to the next thing. But reflection is incredibly important because that's when those stories will come back. Um, and then just being explicit about the messaging, how that there, maybe it's because where we are, it's related to Dia de los Muertos, and we have to acknowledge that. Now we have responses from both Debbie and Maribel. Yeah, I, I, um, a comment on that is that um, a few years ago, um, w I tried to bring together a group at the, d at the Dunbar to um, march in the procession um, and memorialize, this was the Trayvon Martin, this was the, you know, the rash of killings of African American men that I felt was a really wonderful opportunity. Now, I do not speak for the black community. As, you know, I, this is just one experience of, of trying to bring together folks with a very real and connected interest. And the general sentiment was that it was a Mexican celebration um, procession and that this was not a way that that particular community wanted to participate in um, acknowledging the tragedy of those events. And so, and I think that that is a, um, it speaks to many things. It speaks to the black and brown relationship here. Um, it also speaks to the narrative around what the procession is. Um, and tr and exactly, you know, doing what you used to try to really understand and unpack what the procession is. Annabelle, thank you. The the phrase cultural appropriation um, is problematic in many ways because it's a shortcut to point the finger to a very a set of uh, assumptions, and it's not an it's not a space of ethical. Um, negotiation or engagement. It's, it's just a dead end. It's like calling somebody, you're racist. No, I'm not. But you are, but I'm not. <laughs> but you are, <laughs> but I'm not. <laughs> or you're white, or you're brown, or you're black. I mean, all of these things, in, uh, the, wor the phrase cultural appropriation stands in the way of the way that, like those questions Sarita mentioned, specifically try to raise um, a whole different level of engagement with the ethics of the practice. Um, in the phrase cultural appropriation, there are three implied concepts. First, culture, which is the culture. Um, with Day of the Dead, it's very problematic <laughs> because it comes with there are indigenous communities in Mexico who would claim this tradition who were uh, actually appropriated by the Mexican state. <laughs> and their Mexican state, uh, so um, the Mexican state in its apparatus of colonialism appropriated that, and then the Catholic Church <laughs> appropriated it, so who's, where is the culture? And in, I totally agree, that, and there's lots of examples. Uh, the Navajo Nation uh, sued uh, Urban Outfitters um, for, for their use of the word Navajo and selling Navajo panties. and. Um, lighters. You know, uh, this is true. Um, it, and there were cert certain clear parameters of appropriation in a way that, uh, that identified a particular culture. Day of the Dead is, is problematic. The culture of the of All Souls Parade is, a, is, a, is an invented tradition. It's what folklore is. It's an invented tradition. It's festal culture. It's more pagan than Day of the Dead. It's, it's more, it has, it has circus culture in it, it has uh, pageant culture in it. Um, then the, the second part of cultural appropriation is property. Is that ap to appropriate is to take ownership of a property. So you, in the best cases of 
as scholars and native communities trying to establish a sense of a line, a line of appropriation, they have to first establish the injury. Where is the injury and to whom? I, I believe there should be spaces in our community to have those conversations. As, as you all know, I, I spend more time criticizing the festival I produce than I actually spend <laughs> producing it. And those of you who know me know that that's an agonizing process for me. Um, but I do believe we should have the conversation, but the question of property comes with injury. And um, not only on a legalistic basis, and when you go to the procession, you'll see that people are appropriating histories of their own in very, way, very different ways. One of the things that is distinct about culture, festal culture in Tucson, is that people are, it's not just white people celebrating some sort of uh, native tradition, it's native people are there too. Uh, Chicanos are there too, representing their own interpretation of the of the dead. And there are outliers who are kind of weird, you know? Like, okay, what was that all about? And there should be space it, it, through the year to talk about those things and to document them and to create dialogue. And last, <laughs> appro <laughs> appropriation, appropriation worries me in the sense of agency. Because if you police what culture I cannot, if, you, if I tell you you cannot take my culture, then pretty soon you're gonna tell me that I can't take that either, that I can't play with, with that. So it becomes a series of really uh, stiff uh, propositions about how do we invent who we are and how do we live collectively. Now, doesn't mean that everything is for the taking, absolutely, but it means that uh, as ethnic people of color, we also don't want to be, because you know what is the other side of, of that appropriation debate? Stay in your place. Stay in your place and do what you do, and you, you can't do anything else. So that's the flip side, and I know that nine out of 10, that message has been used against me <laughs> to go and enter the spaces where I want to appropriate theory, literature, intellectual practice, that has been used against me. So I, I want to appropriate the tradition of phil Euro European philosophy. I want to appropriate it. All you this. Know? So as all a woman this. of color, as a queer woman of color, I want to appropriate histories that are not mine and transform them. So the, it, it, it can work, in s it can cut both ways, and that's dangerous. It yes. makes me nervous. All but this, all this is true. We keep hearing the words permission and agency, though, and I want to just keep that on the table. Okay. Yet people will steal, people will appropriate, yeah. take property. Rachel, one minute and then we'll get some yeah. questions. Um, just a quick thing. One thing that I think is unique about the All Souls procession is this finale uh, where Flem Shen puts on this huge fire aerial stilt extravaganza, which is a beautiful piece of theater <laughs> if you look at what they're doing. I've been following Flem Shen for 20 years. Um, and the urn was something that they got a Black, Rocks Ar a Black Rock Arts Foundation grant for, $5,000 grant to do in 2005, and then it's become a tradition. So there are these invented, like you said, invented traditions that have have come out of the festival. So I'm curious, this is really a question for people who know the procession better than I do. When you hear about Susan Johnson's, um, I wanna celebrate, I wanna honor my dad and I'm gonna put a, get a shopping cart and put flowers in it and build this large art installation and push, it, push the shopping cart down the street and then 20 friends follow her. At that point, Dia de los Muertos is not in that scenario, right? There's a couple years where where it, she was going off the All Souls Day, which has historically been celebrated since back to pagan times, 2,000 years. At what point, that tipping point, Malcolm Gladwell's concept of the tipping point, at what point did the creep of this sort of like, of, 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 the, of this sort of fusion or, or the, the, the appearance of Dias de los Muertos um, sort of imagery into the event? Uh, maybe Susan knows more about that. Meanwhile, think of your questions. We'll probably have time for two or three, okay? Probably when in the last five years, I think when once the procession went past like the 70,000 person mark and then it got to like 100,000 people and now that's over 100,000. Yeah, I think it's just the scale of that and that kind of like skyrocketed in just the last five years or so. All right, we've got time for just a couple of questions. I'm gonna have to restate the question. Let's start here and then there. And so we've got our first two and three. Um, 
I wanted to talk about, uh, there's a documentary called The Language You're Crying In. And it's a, a documentary about a scholar who went to the Gullah Islands and interviewed this woman who knew the songs from a child. And uh, this, uh, this, she didn't know that the song had to do with ancestry. And so they, they found her, that her people, uh, Mindy people from Sierra Leone. And that the song that she was singing as a child that they thought was a child um, nursery rhyme in indigenous language was actually a song that was done during a ritual at the grave site when our ancestors are, are, are buried. And the song, was sing the, the song in translation was saying, don't forget my name. So the point of me saying this is that when it comes to ancestral worship, ancestral worship, it is an indigenous way of life uh, globally. And that, and that it really concerns me around the word death because in most indigenous cultures, that word doesn't even exist. That is more of a European term um, that comes from, you know, that that a finality where we just believe in transition. So I just thought it was important to say that, especially in relation to the black and brown relationships and what, what, col what colonization and enslavement has done to us. Thank you. And do we have a response from anybody in the panel on that or should we take the next? Thank you for adding that to our mix. We had a question up here, and I'll, I can't reach you, so I'll try to restate it. Yeah, great. Um, it's, it's a oh, hi, Rebecca. So this, this would go to Adam, so we should make sure you, yeah, as best you can. You're not, you're not the only person that does this. There's another 999,999 people that do it. But, uh, I'll but, try to but given that, just to restate the question, yeah, it's kind questions. of a calling in of John O'Neill. Who is this for and what, what do you want them to get out of it in all those things? Who is it for? What, uh, how, how intentional is what they want to get out, is what you want those people to get out of it in terms of education, in terms of alter culture, et cetera? Can you respond to that in two minutes? <laughs> 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 so, um, you got all weekend, Adam. We see you again. He's at pretty much everything we're doing, so just keep bugging him. Uh, uh, to address the, the intention, um, to create a space for people, for the public, uh, to be able to express their grief around death, that's kind of like the primary intention. The second part of that, of how people end up sharing those cultural expressions of grief and death, or of transitioning into other spaces beyond, um, that's kind of an indirect outcome of what the event does. Um, there are groups that have come together to uh, collectively grieve a particular thing or an idea even, and they've made a float that is like an altar to democracy <laughs> and the death of democracy. That, uh, that was one piece that a group of people decided to create for the procession and they walked through that. Um, other people have, have, families have come together to honor a particular death of, of a loved one or of a son or a, a child that died. Um, the, tonight at the park, there's going to be a whole event for children, a uh, procession of little angels. That's like where all the community comes out and makes altars that are dedicated to children. Some of them are made by different groups and families collectively. Um, there isn't really a, a, a specific um, uh, 
textbook or or space in 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 how to tell train or educate anyone on how to make an altar per se but in those spaces as other people come i think by observing and through the kind of osmosis of the experience like other people begin to see like oh i could put a photo on here oh i could put a piece of art on here i i i could put flowers and 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 i think um whenever the workshops are ongoing that people are engaging to make other things aside from altars too like there's other projects and other artistic things that come out of these workshops depending on who's teaching them there's always space for not just like learning about how to grieve but also how to express that artistically and then through that process conversations happen stories are being passed around uh, people are collectively sharing their grief experiences in those spaces um, but those are usually private and not or they're, they're smaller scale they're not talked about that much but they happen like months leading up to the event we um, I hope I answered enough of and those you'll questions. all have most of us will have the opportunity to experience it personally we have one last question and I'm gonna, so I don't have to restate it. Great, it's really more of a comment. I just want, first of all, to say thank you. It is so rare to have the opportunity to have this honest dialogue with all of the complexities of our perspectives and feelings and processing over things that are fundamentally challenging about being in this country and being from where we're from and all of the diversity of what that is. And so thank you for just putting that out there in that way, it was just remarkable. And the, the quick final thing is, because I love this conversation so fundamentally and deeply personally, you said a word at the very end, it just slipped out of your mouth in the last thing that you were saying, and it was the word transformation. And the yes and that you say, or how are we going to go forward from where we are? And that's the idea that for me is compelling, the most compelling as we tease through this complexity. So if I leave you with a question, it's that. What is that? Uh, yeah, if you can do it in 30 seconds, because we're out of time <laughs> with one last thing. I think I want to acknowledge the fact that the growth of two things. The growth of the all souls has created internal problems for the organizers. <laughs> it's not an easy thing to do. They have had to face a, a, a change that came from the, the five year mark that you mentioned, it's also very curious because that is the time span when corporate America got a hold of Day of the Dead as a big thing that became popular. So there is a, a larger context of which is feeding some of these other sort of language and discourse around the festival. I can tell you the organizers struggle with the fact of how to then now contain and retain some of the authenticity of this sort of hybrid practice that is very Tucson in a lot of ways. When I have friends on the south side and they say, boy, I went and that was not at all a Day of the Dead celebration. My answer always is, no, it wasn't. It's not supposed to be at all. In fact, the Day of the Dead images that you see are usually brought in by our own people, bringing some sort of participation of Day of the Dead interpretation. And then in the last five years, this more of like corporate messaging thing that has evolved. And that both in terms of size and closing the streets and hiring police and pouring barricades is also uh, complicated the way, and I, I don't think we spend enough time sometimes in how is it that an intention gets translated to the actual production <laughs> of these cultural works that we curate in words that are really sometimes problematic. Thank you. I didn't mean to grab for that. Okay, I have one more thing, one more thing to add, but before I do that, um, what a discussion. It's just the beginning. Nothing here is solved. Nothing will be solved this weekend or after. Yeah. I tell you what, is this a conversation that should go on the road? And can I tell you something else, just a secret? Um, there was a lot of discussion about whether we should do this at all, whether certain people wanted to participate. The huge courage to have this conversation here and your courage to participate. Hand. Okay, um, this will just take one minute, but when I transition from kind of a, a, a European conservatory way of working and seeing 
to working in community, I had to figure out how to look at things. And I realized that I had not been trained for that. So I'm going to just offer this. Just seven A's. We talked about that, ST, that word appropriation, but that's not one of them. Agency. We heard, talked about it a lot. Who is making the choices? Are they close to the issue? Are, is it of that culture, of that place? Authenticity. Is it real? Is it the, something, is it the thing you can touch? Artistry. We'll see good masks, we'll see lousy masks. Based upon whatever your cultural construct of a lousy mask is, or a good mask. These are not solid things, but you have to ask yourself that. Accuracy. If it means to be factual, is it? Hmm? Is it telling the facts properly? I have this one. And I did that because if you see something that's inaccurate, it makes the work not work, right? Audacity. Doing things in ways that nobody has ever seen them done before. And I cannot wait to see the audacity of this event tomorrow. Audience. Who's it for? What do you want them to get out of it? You know, my King Lear's not going to work for the preschool audience. It didn't. <laughs> Accessibility. Is it accessible? Physically accessible? Is it accessible to people with special needs? Is it accessible in terms of understanding for the audience you want? Do these seven things, these seven A's, and you have a way of looking, a way of making, and a way of analyzing. So I offer that. Use it if you will. Yay! Thank you to Jerry. Thank you to our panelists again. Um, everything that Jerry said about courage and the whole conversation and planning that led to this, I would also add the word generosity. Huge generosity. Um, thank you for uh, the co-decision about adding time. Um, that means, however, that you need to be intentional about your next movements. Those of you who signed up for dine arounds, I especially am talking to you. Once we break, and there's an announcement after mine, so hold on for a second. Once we break, I'm gonna ask you to make your way quickly into your groups in the lobbies. Um, uh, those of you who are hosting the dine around, see me and I will hand you your sheets and give you a note about what you need to know. Um, Shireen is finally going to get to give an announcement. Shireen. <laughs> Shireen is usually our Shireen on the scene who does all announcements and she's so busy doing everything else that she hasn't been able to. So Shireen on the scene, one time appearance. I'm going to make this very brief. Uh, at 7 p.m. there will be a shuttle at Armory Park that will start to take people over to the Barrio Stories. It is going to go between 7 to 8 p.m. So it's a 15-person shuttle. If you want to meet there, and we'll do, it'll go back and forth within that hour. Me, Park, and Nicole. Park and Nicole, raise your hands in case people haven't met you there in the back. Uh, we'll be at the address that's in your program. That's the address the van shuttle has. There is a building there that's on the west side of the park. Um, it's the community center, and there's diagonal parking spots. Spots. That's where we'll be, and we'll be organizing that shuttle to take people over to Barrio start Stories starting at 7. You're more than welcome to get to Barrio Stories yourself and not come there if you don't want to. Um, and then afterward, from 10 to 10.30 at Barrio Stories, the same shuttle will take people back to the hotel if need be. Um, that is my announcement. Go do your thing. See you at sessions. <laughs>